Hello, U.S. history students, and welcome to Unit 4, Lesson 3, Conflict in the 1920s. The decade of the 20s was a decade of change. We've just gotten out of World War I. We're wanting to return to some sense of normalcy, meaning that they want to go back to how life was, or as close to how life was, before the war as they could. But also in the 20s, we see a huge increase in wealth, consumerism, leisure time, and great new forms of entertainment. We also see a huge shift in demographics. So in the 1920s, more people are now living in the city than they are in the country. And this is the first time in American history that we've really seen that number fluctuate in such a manner. Because before this, as you can see in our chart, all the way up through the 1910s, more people, a significantly, a significant amount of more people are living in the country. It's because most of these people are farmers living in the Western territories for the most part, working their farms, living their lives. But after World War I, with the huge boom in industrial growth in factories, because of the war effort and the ramped up production to support the war effort, more and more people are moving to the cities for economic opportunity for jobs. Rural Americans reacted to these changes by attacking the behaviors. The people that are living in the country in this time period could really be seen as the more traditional minded, the ones who believe in how things have always been or the status quo, for example. And they look at all of the stuff that's going on in these cities and they start attacking it and nitpicking it because they view it as an un-American idea or un-American activities. One of the first things that we're going to look at is prohibition. Prohibition is the ban on sale and manufacture of alcohol. The ni year 1920 the 18th Amendment was ratified, meaning that it had been added to the Constitution and all of the states, or a majority of the states, agreed that they would also ban alcohol. This is the beginning of the Prohibition Era. Now, if you think back to the Progressive Era, one of the main things that a lot of women were fighting for, besides their right to vote, was temperance. And temperance is the same thing as prohibition. It's a ban on alcohol. Many rural Americans supported this. They saw it as a noble experiment because they believed the same thing that those temperance leaders believed, that drinking leads to crime, which leads to leaving your family or beating your wife or other social issues of the era. And in order to make sure that all of this is enforced, we get the Volstead Act. And the Volstead Act is the act that is created to give the states the power to enforce the 18th Amendment. Because the Constitutional Amendment itself, while it does prohibit the production, sale, and transport of what they called intoxicating liquors, it doesn't really define what intoxicating liquors are, nor does it provide punishments for it. So in order to enforce the 18th Amendment, we get the Vol Volstead Act. And this has three purposes. The first is to prohibit the intoxicating beverages. So, enforcing the 18th Amendment. The second thing the Act does is to regulate the manufacture, sale, or transport of intoxicating liquor, but not consumption. And then also to ensure the ample supply of alcohol and promote its use in scientific research and in the development of fuels, dyes, and other lawful industries and practices such as religious rituals. So you could still be Catholic and go to church and get wine and things like that. 
It provided that no person shall manufacture, sell, barter, transport, import, export, deliver, or furnish any intoxicating liquor except as authorized by the Act. So, unless it's for fuel, dyes, or religious practice, can't do it. But the other thing, the most important thing that this Act does is it actually defines what an intoxicating liquor is. And the Volstead Act says that an intoxicating liquor is any beverage containing more than 0.5% alcohol by volume and superseded all existing prohibition laws in effect in states that had this legislation. So the Volstead Act, in a nutshell, is the act that basically not only provides what an intoxicating liquor is, but also provides how to regulate the 18th Amendment and enforce it within the states. So if you look at our chart here, causes of prohibition, very religious groups think that drinking alcohol is sinful. Reformers believe that the government should protect the public's health. Basically, they believe that alcohol is making people sick. Reformers believe alcohol led to crime, wife and child abuse, accidents on the job, And during World War I, native-born Americans developed a hostility to German-American brewers and toward their immigrant groups that used alcohol. The effects of this, consumption of alcohol does decline, disrespect for law develops, an increase in lawlessness such as smuggling and bootlegging was evident, criminals found a new source of income, and organized crime grows. So while the consumption of alcohol does go down, Organized crime rises. The U.S. Treasury Department was the organization that was put in charge of enforcing the Volstead Act. So now not only do we have defined parameters for the 18th Amendment under the Volstead Act, but now we have somebody who's going to go around and enforce it. And these guys would go around and take barrels of beer, as you can see in the picture on the left, and just dump them down the storm drain. Or they would break up the barrels with hatchets, or they would throw bottles out the window. Anything they can do to really get rid of alcohol that was meant for public consumption. And as you can see on this chart, we we do see a decrease in consumption of alcohol. Less people are drinking. So, in 1910, on average, 1.6 gallons. By 1921, at our lowest peak, we're just over 0.2 gallons. About 0.25. But then after that, you can see that it does start to increase again. Many urban Americans start to resist prohibition. It's really the rural country folk that want this law passed and want it enforced. But most of the people that are living in the cities are immigrants. And for many immigrant populations, drinking is a cultural norm for them. It's part of their culture. And many urban Americans want to enjoy themselves. So they start going to these illegal top-secret bars called speakeasies. And the reason that it's called a speakeasy is because people were going around speaking quietly about the place in public or even inside of it so as to not alert the police or the neighbors. Basically, you're going to keep quiet about it because you don't want the place to get shut down. So that's why they call it a speakeasy. Demand for illegal alcohol leads to a rise in smuggling, which is also called bootlegging. Moonshining, which is making, like, regular people making beer and alcohol in the backwoods, which is very unsanitary. They don't really actually know how to make it. And this leads to a lot of crime as well. Most of the people that are moonshining are not doing it because they actually know how to do it. They're doing it because they can make money from it. So a lot of these recipes call for 
things that aren't actually meant for human consumption. And a lot of people end up getting sick because of these different combinations of chemicals and things that they're putting in this alcohol. And they would find very ingenious ways to transport this alcohol. As you can see in the car above the words, they're hiding the alcohol bottles in the seats. This is also when the V8 engine starts to become popular because the bootleggers and the rum runners can outrun the cops because their engines are more powerful in the V8 Ford than the cops four cylinder or V6. Organized crime emerges in America because of prohibition. The mafia begins to take control of the illegal alcohol trade and people like Al Capone really begin to rise in society. The most notorious one, of course, is Al Capone. He controls the alcohol trade in Chicago and he owns several speakeasies throughout the city and he's making a whole bunch of money, but he never gets in trouble for the murders he commits, such as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in 1929. He actually gets down, gets brought down and goes to Alcatraz, which is a big prison in San Francisco, because he doesn't pay his taxes. He's making all this money, but he's not paying his income taxes, so he ends up getting in trouble for that. By the end of the 1920s, only 19% of Americans actually support prohibition. 19%. That's not even a quarter of the population. The strongest defenders are, of course, your rural Americans, your, your people that are living in the country, working their farms. But most Americans start to see that prohibition is the cause of most of the problems that are happening, not a solution for them. And so the 18th Amendment becomes the only amendment to ever be repealed or taken away when the 21st Amendment is ratified in 1933. So this doesn't actually take the 18th Amendment away. The 18th Amendment is still in the Constitution because you can't ever completely erase an amendment. It just makes it not legal anymore. It makes it not a functioning amendment anymore. Basically, the 21st Amendment supersedes the 18th. We also see a huge resurgence of intolerance and nativism within the 1920s. We saw nativism in the Gilded Age when we saw this huge influx of Southern and Eastern Europeans coming into the United States and Nativism is the belief that if a person is born in that country, they're better than a person coming to that country. 800,000 Southern and Eastern European immigrants arrived each year in the early 1920s. 800,000 new citizens, or not, well, not citizens, but new residents. And again, your rural Americans, your country folk, thought of these immigrants as un-American, non-Protestant, anarchist, and socialist. Anarchy is a lack of government, a lack of control. If things are in anarchy, they're just going crazy. And a lot of the people that are coming to the United States aren't anarchists, and they're not trying to take away the American social norm. They're doing the same thing in the 1920s they were doing in the 1890s. They're escaping religious persecution or wars or things that are happening in their home country. And they're coming here mostly to get jobs, to have a better life. But we see a rise of fear of these immigrants. These, pe these Americans, these native-born Americans are scared of the people that are coming. We see this manifest itself mostly in the Red Scare. In 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution happens in Russia, and Russia becomes communist. 
By definition, communism is a society in which all property is publicly owned and each person works and is paid according to their abilities and needs. The entire goal of communism is a utopian society, a perfect world, where everyone is equal and everybody has everything they need. In practice, it doesn't really work that way. But communism really goes against American democracy and American free enterprise economy because the government literally controls every aspect of people's lives. And so while the Soviet Union is created in Russia, we get afraid that people are going to come from there and spread their communist propaganda and eventually communism is going to take over the United States. So the Red Scare, union strikes, the growth of Eugene Debs's Socialist Party spread huge fears of a Russian-style socialist revolution. Basically, they're afraid that the same thing that happened in Russia in 1917 was going to come and happen here. Now, socialism is more of an idea that the means of production, distribution, and exchange should be owned or regulated by the community as a whole. So it's a little bit different than communism, but a lot of people will put the two terms together. During the Red Scare, immigrants all over the nation were under attack. One of the most famous is the 1920 arrest and charging of Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vazzetti. In April of that year, um, a shoe company uh, owner was shot and killed along with his guard. And the murderers were described by witnesses as two Italian men who escaped with more than $15,000. After going into a garage to claim a car that the police said was connected with the crime, Sacco and Vanzetti were arrested and charged with the crime. Although both men carried guns and made false statements upon their arrest, neither had a previous criminal record, and pretty much all of the evidence that they had actually done this was what we call circumstantial, meaning not actually good, solid evidence to convict them. Um, authorities actually didn't come up with any real evidence that they had stolen the money. Much of the other evidence was later discredited. But because of the fear and the fact that they were Italian immigrants who spoke very little English, they were charged with robbery and murder. And they were found guilty based on circumstantial evidence. The fact that they were Italian immigrants and they were anarchy. They were anarchists. They believed in a lack of a government. They were executed. These two men were put to death because of fear. In response to nativism, Congress actually passes new immigration restrictions in both 1921 and 1924, and these laws create quotas or limits that place maximum numbers of how many immigrants from each country are allowed to enter the United States each year. Under these quotas, we get things such as the Emergency Quota Act, which restricted the number of immigrants admitted from any country annually to 3% of the number of residents from that same country living in the United States as of the 1910 census. So they were basing the amount of people that would be allowed in on the number of people who were already living here 10 years prior, over 10 years prior. These laws targeted those immigrants who came from Southern and Eastern Europe and or Asia. And so, as you can see in our pie charts here, Northern Western Europe is the red, Southern and Eastern Europe is the blue. From 1901 to 1910, a large portion of that pie chart, 75% of it, 
are coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. From 1911 to 1920, the numbers drop slightly, but still the majority coming are from Southern and Eastern Europe. It's not until 1921 and after that the number actually goes down for people coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. The 1920s also see a rise in the second coming of the KKK. The KKK promotes, in their eyes, traditional American values, and they use violence and fear to attack anybody that they see as not okay, not good enough. These are immigrants, African Americans, Catholics, Jews, socialists, people who don't believe the same way they do or don't look the same way that they do. Now, the KKK actually begins during and after the Civil War. And at that time, the Klan really focused on being a vehicle for white Southern resistance to Reconstruction-era policies aimed at establishing political and economic equality for African Americans. The Klan that emerges in the 20s is significantly different and their range of people that they go against has grown. In Dallas in particular, the Klan presence was very large. This uh, photo here that you can see is an invitation for Klan Day at the Te State Fair of Texas, Wednesday, October 24th. The public is invited to witness Initiation of the largest class in the history of the Clandom. Spectacular fireworks display history of the Klan. Inspired ad addresses by speakers of international reputation. And basically, in that, I believe it was 1923, you could go and they had Klan Day at the fair and they sold like souvenir books to commemorate the day. And you can actually, the Dallas Historical Society owns one of those books. And it's just terrible to go through and see all the stuff that they did. But their presence in the city of Dallas in this era in politics was also particularly large. Um, it's said that you couldn't get a job in Dallas political society if you were not a member of the Klan. By 1924, the KKK had 4.5 million members and elected politician to power in several states. Um, as you can see in our map on the left, Texas in particular has a U.S. Senator as well as major era of conflict and violence. But most states in the South have either governors elected with Klan support or U.S. senators elected with Klan support. So the blue circles are governors, the green triangles are senators that are elected to political office with the support of the KKK. And the last bit of conflict we're going to look at is religion. Many country rural Americans find comfort in religious fundamentalism, which essentially means that they focus on a literal interpretation of the Bible. Many of these rural folks reject urban values, especially immigrants and flappers. They do not believe in the modern woman. They believe that a woman's place is in the home. She should dress appropriately and modestly. And they see these new modern women as inappropriate. And then we see evangelists. These are Christians who go and use radios to broadcast Christian messages around the country. In many cases, they're very exaggerated, very... Um, loud and try to get your attention and they 
they go on the radio and they broadcast their beliefs to most of the country because by this time period, we've got radio broadcasts that really come in and help bring the nation together. Many rural Christians rejected these ideas that contradict the Bible. One issue in particular was a teacher named John Scopes, and he's in Dayton, Tennessee, and he starts teaching the theory of evolution to his biology class. And the theory of evolution was written by Charles Darwin. Basically, the premise of what these people take from it is that humans evolve from monkeys. Because the theory of evolution is we all evolve from something different. We evolve, we change, we grow. This is a very Christian, very fundamentalist area that believes in a strict interpretation of the Bible. And the theory of evolution goes against that. And so John Scopes actually gets arrested and put on trial. And it becomes the Scopes monkey trial. And it was this national sensation that everybody wanted to go out and see. And there were spectators. They were coming from hundreds to thousands of miles away just to see this trial. And what it really comes down to is it was a trial of traditional, fundamental Christian beliefs versus modernity and science and like urban America. So they bring in two of the most prominent lawyers of the time. The first on the defense side is ACLU attorney Clarence Darrow. And he's the guy that defends Scopes, trying to say that he was not doing anything wrong. He was not trying to push his beliefs on anybody. He was simply teaching what science is saying. And he represents the urban American science, modernity, new idea side of the trial. And then the prosecutor brings in William Jennings Bryan, our cross of gold, bimetallism, failed presidential candidate from back during the progressive era. And he represents Christianity and rural traditional values. Scopes ends up being found guilty, but evolutionists believe that they won because Darrow got Brian in the trial to admit that the world might not have been made in six 24-hour days. So he gets the Darrow, our defense attorney, gets Brian, our prosecuting attorney, to admit maybe the Bible isn't so literal. So a lot of the evolutionists believe this is a win. So America in the 20s really is a decade of change. In the economic side, there was an increase in consumerism, which leads or is because of the huge boosts in technology and industry. We get cars, we get radios, we get movies. And the government, government policies start to favor businesses and isolationism. We kind of go back to more of a laissez-faire, lack of government involvement kind of concept. And the government kind of leaves businesses alone again. And then the societal and social life. Women and African Americans experience new freedoms. Women are now these modern women who can wear what they want and cut their hair and dance in public. African Americans are expressing their culture and what they believe in. We see that mainly in the Harlem Renaissance. But immigrants are coming under attack because of the Red Scare and this great fear of change and takeover within the country. This is going to bring us to the end of Unit 4, Lesson 3, Conflict in the 1920s. See you back here for Unit 5, Lesson 1, Causes of the Great Depression. I hope you have a great day.